Discurso da professora Xoxana Sbov na divulgação do comentário geral número 25 da CDC sobre o direito das crianças em relação ao ambiente digital. I'm so honored to be here with all of the young people who are watching this presentation today and of course the heroes from all over the world who have worked to make this day come true on the vital indeed sacred and urgent subject of children's rights which can only be and always be global fundamental human rights so thank you for having me you know it's kind of uh, shocking when i think about the fact that it was just a year ago this month that much of the world went into lockdown families and teachers around the world abruptly found themselves scrambling for answers to one question what about school at that time google classroom which is the free service that teachers use to share assignments and communicate with students, boasted 40 million active users worldwide. Today, that number is more than 150 million. Now, it's likely that few, if any, of the moms and dads and teachers and school administrators who are part of this 150 million strong group of Google Classroom users, it's unlikely that they are aware that just a few weeks before the March 2020 lockdowns, a gentleman called Hector Balderas, the Attorney General of the state of New Mexico here in the United States where I live, and where 60% of public school districts already use Google's educational apps and devices. Attorney General Baderas had launched a lawsuit against Google, citing its quote, educational tools for illicit data extraction practices aimed at children, unquote. The state's investigation revealed that, quote, Google tracks children across the internet, across devices, in their homes, and well outside the educational sphere all without obtaining verifiable parental consent. Google has used this access to collect massive quantities of data from young children, not to benefit the schools, but to benefit Google's own commercial interests." Close quote. Attorney General Baderas found that these secret data mining operations of what I have called surveillance capitalism dominate Google's platforms, despite a 2015 pledge made by the company to no longer collect, store, share, retain, or deploy student information for behavioral ad targeting. And despite a $170 million fine in 2019 to settle charges of illegally harvesting the personal data of children on YouTube a powerful economic logic takes no holidays. And as Balderas knew, only law can stop it. The classroom is not the only arena in which these extractive practices have grown to a, a relentless and voracious state. Even when we look at a medium that we have once considered innocently and called it social media, we encounter the same extractive economic practices bearing down on our children and with great consequence. One study looked at adolescents across 10 countries and five continents and ask them to do one simple thing. And that was to disconnect from every kind of digital media for only 24 hours. I felt so lonely, I could not sleep well without sharing or connecting to others, a Chinese girl recalled. And an Argentine boy moaned, 
Emptiness overwhelms me. A Ugandan teenager whispered, I felt like there was a problem with me. And an American college student confessed, I went into absolute panic mode. These are but a few of the lamentations plucked from the thousand student participants asked to abstain from the digital medium in this way for a short period of time. Their experience released a planet-wide cri de coeur that even the study's directors found unsettling, startling. The researchers observed that the loneliness and acute disorientation that overwhelmed these young people, it wasn't simply that they didn't know what to do with themselves, but rather that they had problems articulating what they were feeling or even who they were when they couldn't connect. The students felt as if, quote, they had lost a part of themselves, close quote. These effects are not random. They are engineered for corporate profits, whether we are in school or the once innocent medium of social media. Facebook and other social media have learned to bite hard on the psychological needs of our young people, creating new obstacles to critical developmental processes that build individual identity, inner resources, voice, and moral compass. The consequences are evident in a parade of studies on the emotional toll of social media on our young people. Our children have become humanity's canaries in the coal mine. We sent them out to experiment with a new life of the hive, constructed to weaken the will and block all exits. The world wide web that we once imagined as a free public space for voice and connection, it fell quickly to market forces that we could not see and did not understand. And by now it is no exaggeration to say that the web is owned and operated by surveillance capital. The hive world of social media is rigorously engineered according to surveillance capitalism's economic imperatives, aiming to maximize engagement as a means to maximum data extraction all of it relying on key operational mechanisms, including real-time rewards and punishments of things like, did they like me? How many likes did I receive? Or the doomsday signal, was I ignored? Our children also experience engineered social comparison dynamics subliminal cues, psychological micro-targeting, and much, much more. Facebook's North American marketing director once celebrated these achievements, boasting that while the average adult checks their phone 30 times a day, the average millennial does so 150 times a day, and we now know that Generation Z, 64% of these young people are smart, who are smartphone users, report continuously being connected throughout all the hours of every day. The executive from Facebook described that corporation's engineering feat in, achieve, in, in achieving this degree of connection. And she described it as building an immersive, engrossing, immediate sensory experience of communication that kids can connect with without ever having to look away. Of course, if they look away, then no data is being extracted. And so this construction as a hive with no exit becomes an economic imperative. As a Silicon Valley data scientist recently said to me in an interview, the underlying norm of virtually all software and apps design is now data collection. All software design, 
assumes that all data should be collected. My friends, this is the world in which our children have been sent to roam without the rights and laws that are necessary to keep them safe. Indeed, we all roam naked in this new landscape. Just as a century ago, we faced the giants of industrialization without workers' rights or consumers' rights, the laws we needed to implement such rights and the institution to govern them. It's true that the 21st century floods us with information at our fingertips. Yet strangely, these last two decades have also been a time of profound forgetting. Most poignantly, we have forgotten our children. Before the 20th century, national constitutions had little to say on the matter of children's rights. But the 20th century was the great awakening when the struggle for children's rights caught fire. And by the end of the century, dozens of national constitutions around the world recognized the unique rights of children to protection, to education, to identity, family, political, and socioeconomic justice. This critical advance, of course, was uh, institutionalized in the General Assembly's adoption of the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child, which set the standard for the international recognition of children as holders of inherent and inalienable rights. But as the digital century dawned, we learned that the myth of cyberspace impressed upon us as a world apart where the norms of society and its rights and laws somehow no longer hold. And in this mythos of cyberspace, despite the fact that we had worked so hard to achieve these rights and laws, they lost their standing and we were told that they lost their relevance. As former Google CEO Eric Schmidt wrote on the very first page of his 2014 book on the digital future, he said, the online world is not truly bound by ter terrestrial laws. This is the world's largest ungoverned space. Indeed, surveillance capitalism rooted and grew in record time in the absence of law to impede its practices. So no wonder it's taken us a while to get our bearings. But we can now see that there is no cyberspace, that there is no emperor, there is no wizard, behind the curtain, only capital, machines, knowledge, and people. In this spirit, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has accomplished what few authoritative bodies and governments have so far done. They have recognized that our rights and laws must adhere in every domain of society, without exception private and public, whether populated by machines or people, and that this principle is a matter of profound consequence to the outcome of human existence in the digital century. Embedding children's rights into all things digital marks the end of the cyberspace mythos and the beginning of the future that we must fight for. It is intolerable that nearly every imaginary of this future now, especially those imaginaries created by our young people, leans toward the dystopian. We cannot allow this to be our legacy. The general comment is also a groundbreaking document because for the first time it transfers primary responsibility from individuals to institutions, from children and parents to governments and businesses. And it empowers lawmakers with a detailed map of the existential threats 
and the practical actions to vanquish those threats. This is the next great awakening, my friends. It's the beginning of a new era in which we come together from every region to create the digital future that we want to bequeath to our children. To New Mexico's Attorney General, the general comment declares that, quote, states parties should prohibit by law the profiling or targeting of children of any age for commercial purposes and on the basis of a digital record of their actual or inferred characteristics and that businesses must comply, close quote. To the social media architects who build the social hive from which our children have so much difficulty escaping, the general comment insists that states must ensure a digital environment that does not interfere with our children's lives. It explains that this will require, quote, introducing or updating data protection regulation and design standards that identify, define, and prohibit that man anything that manipulates or interferes with children's rights to freedom of thought. Automated systems should not be used to affect or influence children's behavior or emotions or to limit their opportunities to development." Close quote. Friends, for two decades, we have unwittingly sent our children as canaries into the digital coal mine. And they have shown us the results, what has ennobled them and what has diminished them. Now, thanks to the committee's historic work and everything that everyone here has done, together with the visionary leadership of five rights and the participation of children and experts like you from around the world, the youngest among us are no longer canaries, but the vanguard. Empowered with the rights won for them over the last century and brought forward now into the digital century with this historic document, our children can pave the road and light the beacons that the rest of us will surely follow as together we build an information civilization founded on human rights and flourishing under the rule of law. To lawmakers and decision makers in every land, I urge you to take this powerful gift and waste no time putting it to work. Build the ennobling future for which all humanity yearns. There is no time to waste. Thank you. Para mais informações, visite www.fiverightsfoundation.com.